So I was, I was asked to talk about entrainment and I made this into a very kind of a basic type of talk, um, just understanding what entrainment is, where to use it and how to interpret it. So instead of using the term entrainment, I'm going to say overdrive pacing. Okay, so entrainment is a particular part or a particular kind of overdrive pacing during tachycardia and certain criteria have to be met before you call something entrainment. So we'll start with the term overdrive pacing and what that really means is you have some tachycardia going on and you're going to pace a little faster than the tachycardia to determine what the mechanism of the tachycardia is. That really is the top priority when you have a tachycardia, when you're trying to do overdrive pacing, the first thing you want to know is what is the mechanism of the tachycardia because that really determines how you're going to approach the mapping and ablation of this tachycardia. And then the second part of it, once you know the mechanism is some sort of re-entry, it can be used to identify what the critical isthmus is, where do you want to go ablate, and where do you not want to ablate. So we'll talk about these two in two parts. So first the mechanism and then trying to figure out where the circuit is. So why does the mechanism matter, right? So you have three major mechanisms of tachycardia. You have abnormal automaticity, you have triggered activity, and then you have re-entry. So anything that's abnormal automaticity or triggered re-entry, you're going to have a totally different approach to mapping. So it's like drop, dropping a pebble in a pond and then finding out where the ripples are going. So that's abnormal automaticity. There is a focus somewhere that's firing spontaneously and mapping is much easier, right? So all that you need to do is take your catheter and play hot and cold. You just have to figure out which is the earliest spot or the hottest spot, earliest activation during the tachycardia, go ablate, and typically just a few ablation lesions, maybe just one ablation lesion is going to take care of it. That's completely different from re-entry, where there is a multiple set of criteria that need to be met for re-entry to be set up and you, you want to go and figure out where the circuit is and interrupt the circuit and the critical isthmus. So point ablation is not going to, be, uh, uh, is not going to work for re-entry. In some re-entrant rhythms like ischemic VTs, activation mapping can also be quite hard and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about activation mapping today. So entrainment mapping in those situations is very helpful. So what is re-entry and, and how does it start and how does entrainment work in re-entry? So entrainment is basically a maneuver that you use to uh, determine that a, uh, that a tachycardia is re-entrant and not automatic or triggered automaticity, right? So some of the prerequisites for re-entry is that you have an area of slow conduction within the myocardium and that the area be bound by some sort of anatomical boundaries or functional boundaries. It doesn't always have to be anatomical. The boundaries may be something that occur just during tachycardia, meaning it would be functional. But there's got to be some kind of boundary that bounds this critical isthmus or critical area of slow conduction. So in the top figure here, let's say this limb two here of the circuit is where the slow conduction is. Say the patient has had a myocardial infarction and there is slowing of conduction. So what happens in sinus rhythm, I don't think my mouse is working there. So what happens in sinus rhythm is there is uniform activation of limb one, limb two, and then there is, there's really no setup for a re-entry to happen. So this gets activated this way and then, again my mouse isn't working there. And then this gets activated this way and there's really no way of having re-entry. So when you see VT, what starts VT typically is a PVC, correct? So in this sinus rhythm, if there is a PVC, say some premature complex happens, there is going to be block in one direction in this slow zone because there is refractoriness of the tissue. The tissue cannot recover fast enough. So there is unidirectional block in the slow zone, but conduction still continues through limb one, which is more normal. And by the time it comes around, this refractory period of the myocardium is recovered and it can conduct very slowly such that it can set up re-entry and if this can happen over and over again, that's when you have re-entrant tachycardia. So for a re-entry to happen, there has to be a slow conduction zone and there has to be unidirectional block in that zone and then conduction in the opposite direction to set up uh, re-entry. So uh, having that construct in mind, we look at how overdrive pacing and single PVCs during uh, tachycardia help you determine that this is re-entry or not. And this is 
this is a concept that kind of we have to play in our mind over and over again. So if you feel like you've, you know, you've lost me at some point, just stop me and we can go over it again. Okay, thank you. Which one is it? The top one? Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. I think we'll skip this. We just talked about that. So again, a slow area of slow conduction. So for in this example, there is scar in the perimitral region. This is a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. There is scar in the inferior region. And there could be slow conduction around this region to set up re-entry. And when you look at sinus rhythm EGMs, there is a lot of fractionation and slow conduction in that region. So that's the kind of electrograms that you would see if you're going to be dealing with re-entry. Whereas compare that to the normal region here where you have a sharp electrogram occurring during sinus rhythm. Before we start any case of VT, we want to have some sense for what the substrate is uh, and, and MRI and CT scans, but mostly MRI of the heart can be very helpful in knowing where the substrate is. We particularly find this helpful in non-ischemic cardiomyopathies where it's more patchy of a kind of substrate more fibrosis in the epicardial region, but the ischemics can also have epicardial substrate. So uh, typically in our lab, if we are not doing some emergent VT case we have, we would have a, C, uh, a cardiac MRI in these patients. And I'm sure we'll talk more about this later, so I'll skip this and go to the actual pacing maneuvers. Okay. So to understand how fusion reset and progressive fusion work, we'll start with an example of how a single PVC delivered during tachycardia would work. Okay, so and then we'll progress to how a series of pacing uh, spikes would work in, in tachycardia. So we're going to talk about just one PVC now. So there is VT going on and we're going to talk about one PVC. So in the first panel here, there is re-entry. You can think about this portion as the blue portion here as being your re-entrant circuit uh, with the slow zone. And there is, I'm sorry, the, this portion is the re-entrant circuit. There is usually an entry and an exit to the circuit and then the critical isthmus in between. And now I'm going to deliver a PVC during the tachycardia from a site that's far away from where the re-entrant circuit is. So if you want to determine the mechanism of tachycardia, one of the first things you want to do is pace from far away from where you think the tachycardia circuit is, you shouldn't be pacing from within the circuit. That second part we'll get to later. So the PVC is being delivered with, from a site that's far away, and now this wavefront of propagation is going to go in two directions in your, towards your circuit. One, it's going to go orthodromically, which is basically the same direction as your tachycardia, so it's going to penetrate the circuit orthodromically and it's also going to penetrate the circuit antidromically, which is the, the opposite direction of, where, of the re-entrant circuit. So the antidromic wavefront is going to hit the previous tachycardia beat, and it's going to be extinguished. But this is the, uh, this is the antidromic one is what is going to produce the fusion that you see on your uh, surface ECG. So when there is antidromic fusion, there is going to be part of the myocardium getting activated by the PVC and the other part of the myocardium getting activated by the tachycardia exiting the circuit. Does that make sense? So this part is what causes the fusion during tachycardia. Now the reset is caused by the orthodromic wavefront. Now the orthodromic wavefront is going to go down the circuit in the same direction as the circuit and then eventually exit out so the next beat is going to come a little earlier because your PVC was earlier, it has just advanced the next beat a bit earlier and that is the reset part of it. So fusion is caused by the antidromic wavefront, reset which is advancement of the next beat is caused by the orthodromic wavefront. So we'll see an example of that. So before you do any of these maneuvers, some of the baseline things you want to do is you want to know what tachycardia looks like, which you have already, you've already induced it. But before that, you want to know what pure pacing looks like. Otherwise, you won't know what the fusion between pacing and tachycardia would look like, right? So here, the first panel here is the fusion, I'm sorry, is the pacing alone. So we are pacing from the RV catheter there. 
And then the second panel here shows you the tachycardia. The first two beats on the screen here are basically your VT. And then the third beat, you can see a pacing spike and it's being delivered from the RV catheter. And it is very late coupled. So that's one of the things you want to be very careful about. You don't want to bring your uh, PVC in too close to the uh, previous beat. So a nice late coupled PVC. And you can see that there is morphology change when you deliver that PVC. And this morphology is a fusion between what this tachycardia looks like and what this pacing looks like. And I think at least in this example, you can see it best in the inferior lead. So focus on 2-3 AVF. You can see that in AVF during pacing, it's a little positive and then negative. During tachycardia, it's completely negative. And when you deliver the PVC, it's a combination of the two. So that's the fusion part of it. And that's caused by the antidromic wavefront penetrating the circuit. This the reset part of it, you have to determine after the pacing has been completed, right? So you look at the beat after the pacing, and this comes in a little sooner than what you would anticipate if it had been just tachycardia, right? So that part is the reset part, and that's because the orthodromic wavefront is going through the circuit, exiting, and bringing in the next beat a little sooner. Does that make sense? So that's fusion and reset. Okay, so that's the first principle of entrainment. Now, say if this were, uh, and uh, we will get to that later. We'll talk about progressive fusion after that. So what is progressive fusion is basically what happens if you pace a little faster and faster. So in other words, if you're delivering single PVCs, what happens if you bring your PVC in a little sooner and then a little sooner after that, right? So the sooner you pace during the tachycardia cycle length, there's going to be a greater contribution to the activation of the myocardium from your paced beat and lesser contribution from the tachycardia exit itself. So the, the faster you pace or the sooner you bring in your PVC, you're going to have a fused beat that looks more and more like your paced beat and less and less like your tachycardia beat. Does that make sense? So that's progressive fusion. In other words, where the uh, collision between the extra stimulus and the antidromic wavefront occurs, is going to occur more and more towards the circuit. And so you have more and more activation of the myocardium by the pace stimulus itself. So as an example, let's take a look at the same VT that we looked at in the other, other example. So this is pure pacing alone in the first panel here. This is pure VT. And let's start looking at what happens if you bring in that PVC a little sooner and then a little sooner, right? So here, this is a late coupled PVC. You have fusion, but a lot of this looks like VT and a little less like uh, the paste beat. And this is a little earlier PVC. You're going to start seeing that it looks more and more like the paste beat. So example, in lead two, you actually have uh, R wave compared to the, the pure VT beat. And by the last panel, you're bringing it in even sooner. So the PVC is more early coupled. And by that time, the fused beat looks more like the, t the pacing beat rather than the tachycardia beat. So the faster you pace, the fusion looks more like pacing and less like tachycardia. So that's progressive fusion. And what if we do this over and over again? Right, so we talked about just placing one PVC during tachycardia. What if we uh, uh, deliver, say, seven or eight pace beats during tachycardia? That's when entrainment comes in. So repetitive and stable fusion and reset of tachycardia by delivering a series of uh, pace beats would, would be entrainment, basically. And the same principles apply. And you can take it one more step further. So we talked about fusion, we talked about reset, progressive fusion, but if you're delivering a series of stimuli, you can also look at what happens after the last stimulus is delivered. Okay, so that's the third criteria for entrainment. So let's say you deliver one stimulus, is what we talked about, and then you deliver a second one after that. So the second one is again going to penetrate the circuit orthodromically and penetrated antidromically, but this time the antidromic wave front is going to collide with the previous pace beat. So, and that's going to get repeated over and over again as long as you're pacing. And then you're going to suddenly stop pacing at some point, and the last pace beat is going to go through the circuit orthodromically, but 
and collide with the, uh, but there is nothing to collide with antidromically, right? Because there is no previous beat. So the, it's going to come out and look like your tachycardia circuit, or rather your tachycardia beat, but it's going to come a little sooner. It's going to come at the pacing cycle length. So that's the third criteria for entrainment where you deliver a series of beats and basically the last beat is going to look like the tachycardia but it comes at the cycle length of pacing. Does that make sense? Now this is a little simplistic. Sometimes it may not come at the pacing cycle length because there is going to be decrement within the circuit and things like that. But at least to understand what entrainment is, this is, this is a basic construct for it. So again, another example, this is pacing during VT. You have the VT beats on the right-hand side and the, first, and the first two beats here are pacing. And you can see that there is manifest fusion. So the, the fusion doesn't look like the tachycardia, so you can clearly see that it's fused. And the last beat comes at the pacing cycle length, but looks like the tachycardia beat. Does that make sense? So this is your last accelerated beat, but it looks like the tachycardia. So that's your third criteria for entrainment. Now that's VT, and the same principles apply to re-entry within the atrium it's itself, which we <coughs> typically call atrial flutter. So with VT, the showing fusion is much easier because we are going to use the 12 lead electrogram, and I'm sorry, 12 lead ECG, and uh, it's a very good, marker of global ventricular activation. But the P wave is so hard to see during uh, uh, the atrial flutter, it often is falling on the T wave itself. So showing surface fusion for atrial flutter is much harder. So what we use is the intracardiac electrogram equivalent for the same thing. And to be able to do something like that, you really do have to have a lot of uh, uh, electrodes within the heart, uh, typically spanning all parts of the chamber that you're trying to map. So the surrogate and atrial flutter would be the intracardiac electrograms, and this is an example. So before we look at this, I'll show you what the setup is. This is, the first view is the RAO view. Hmm. There we go. This is the RAO view, and this is the LAO view. In the RAO view, you have the CS catheter and another 20-pole uh, catheter that's sitting on the lateral wall of the right atrium. So this one is spanning the right atrium, this one is spanning the left atrium, and we don't have one here in this case, but I typically put one on the septum as well, so you, you're measuring septal activation. So again, same principles here. You want to know what pure pacing looks like. You want to know what pure tachycardia looks like. So you would know when you pace whether there is fusion there or not and whether there is stable fusion or not. So this is basically tachycardia. This is, few, this is just pacing without tachycardia, and when you pace from the same uh, uh, electrode during tachycardia, you can see that part of this activation looks like, tachy, uh, looks like the tachycardia, and the other part looks like pacing. So this part looks like pacing. So, and, and that, how much of it looks like tachycardia and how much looks like pacing is going to be determined by how fast you're pacing. So on the last panel, there is fusion. And this is progressive fusion using intracardiac electrograms. So if you're pacing faster and faster and faster, and just keep in mind what pacing looked like before, right? It's the same case. So this, this part looks like tachycardia. This, there is some orthodromic capture here of some of the electrograms, but this part here going up this way looks like pacing. By the time you pace much faster at 200 milliseconds, most of it looks like pacing, right? So this is going this way, this is going this way, and most of it looks like pacing. So that's progressive fusion during tachycardia. Does that make sense so far? So that, that's the part of really understanding what entrainment is, how to use it to make sure that you're dealing with re-entrance circuit or not. Now what if this was an automaticity? Would you see stable fusion during automaticity? What do you guys think? Anyone? Usually not, usually not. There will be some variation, depends on what the mechanism of the tachycardia is. Sometimes you would just suppress the tachycardia and you would see just pure pacing, but you typically would not see progressive fusion or stable fusion when you pace during automaticity. So extremely useful maneuver to know what the, what the actual mechanism is so you can set up your 
uh, mapping windows accordingly. You can think about, oh, am I going to be looking for the earliest electrogram or am I going to be looking for diastolic potentials that I'm going to target for ablation during reentry? So just to summarize this first part, as a, as a practical matter, you want to know, make sure that the tachycardia is stable before you start pacing. So an unstable tachycardia, you really cannot make much of entrainment maneuvers. You want to pace from a spot that's outside the likely circuit, so you can clearly show fusion and progressive fusion. You don't want to pace from inside the circuit to begin with. You typically want to pace about 10 to 30 milliseconds faster than the cycle length of the tachycardia. Anything faster may just terminate your tachycardia and make your life much harder. And before you start pacing during tachycardia, you want to know what pure pacing would look like or at least have some mental idea of, oh, I'm pacing from the RV apex. This is what it's going to look like. And then for VT, use the 12 lead ECG for assessing fusion. And for atrial flutter, you really want to have plenty of electrodes within the heart to know what that fusion would look like. Few other pointers when you are assessing entrainment maneuvers. Number one, all the myocardial tissue needs to be accelerated. So if you have certain parts of the circuit that are not getting accelerated, certain parts of the heart, electrograms not getting accelerated to the paced cycle length, that's not a maneuver that you can interpret. So that's one thing that you want to make sure. And then after that, once you know there is acceleration of the tachycardia, you're going to look for fixed or constant fusion, stable fusion at a constant pacing cycle length, progressive fusion with progressively faster pacing, and then resumption of the same tachycardia after the pacing is completed. So that's another thing. If you terminate tachycardia or if, or if it comes out as some other morphology after you stop pacing, again, that's not a maneuver that you can really interpret. And typically, you want to see the same cycle length of tachycardia come out as well. So if it's faster after you finish pacing, again, hard to interpret that maneuver. So how do we use this to define whether we are within the circuit or not? And how do we use it to define whether we are at the critical isthmus or, or another site, like a bystander site? because that's going to be helpful in knowing where you're going to ablate a re-entry, right? So, so far you know your tachycardia is re-entry. Now you're going to determine which part of the circuit of re-entry you're in, so you know where to go and ablate. So things to look for when you're doing overdrive pacing for this is one, you're going to look at before pacing, what is the timing of my local electrogram? And we'll go over each one of these in detail, okay? The second thing you're going to look for is, is there fusion? Is there manifest fusion either on the surface ECG for VT or in the intracardiac electrograms for a rhythm like atrial flutter? The third thing you're going to look for is what is the post-pacing interval? So what is the post-pacing interval? It's basically the time from this last stimulus to the return electrogram on your pacing electrode. And what that represents is it represents the time it takes for the activation to go from your electrode to the circuit, through the circuit, and back to your electrode. So that's the post-pacing interval. So you want to measure that and then compare it to what it looks like in comparison to the tachycardia cycle length. And then finally, you want to look at stimulus to QRS and electrogram to QRS, and we'll go over some, of ex some examples for that as well. Again, before you start measuring some of these things, a few words of caution, because we often get excited by entrainment maneuvers and we just start measuring PPI. But before you do anything, you really want to make sure that the tachycardia got accelerated. Sometimes when you pace, it doesn't capture, it looks like manifest, I'm sorry, it looks like um, good fusion on your, uh, on your ECG, but what you're really doing is you're doing nothing to the tachycardia. So you want to make sure you accelerated it. Number two, you want to make sure that the same tachycardia and similar cycle length resumed after you stop pacing. So those things are very important before you start measuring anything. Another thing that comes up in BT is you may have a lot of different multi-component <coughs> electrograms on your uh, catheter during mapping and on entrainment mapping as well. And it, it's very hard to know which one of those multi-component electrograms is the local electrogram, right? So overdrive pacing from those sites can be helpful. And it's also important to recognize that so you measure the right electrogram for your PPI. So one example of that here, this is during tachycardia. 
So you have the 12 lead ECG up there. You have a um, RV electrode, CS electrode. We typically have a lot more <coughs> electrodes during our cases, but this is just to demonstrate. So I put just the main ones up there. And then the bottom one is the roving catheter. This, this is distal ablation and then the proximal ablation. And you can see on the distal ablation, there is a sharp electrogram in the middle of diastole. And then there's another electrogram that's multi-component, just pre-systolic, right? So we don't know which one of these electrograms is the local electrogram, maybe both, maybe one of them, and pacing would help you determine that. So this is during pacing from the same ablation catheter. And you can see that this electrogram actually gets captured and this one gets released. See that? So the mid-diastolic one is not your local electrogram. The electrogram that's local and getting captured is this electrogram here, which is represented by this one here. So you want to measure your PPI or the post-pacing interval to this electrogram, not to this one. And same thing, when you, if you're going to do activation mapping and you want to annotate a particular electrogram, you have to know which one to annotate to. So you don't want to annotate to this one, but you rather annotate to this electrogram. So keeping those things in mind, let's talk about what the uh, parts of a hypothetical uh, reentry circuit is going to look like. So you have the critical isthmus. Here it's labeled as common pathway. There's going to be an entrance site into the circuit, and then there's going to be an exit site out of the circuit. And then you can have multiple other loops that are connected to the same circuit but are not critical for the circuit. So basically, you, you could have an inner loop. You could have an outer loop. But you have to remember ablation in the outer loop or the inner loop is not going to get rid of the circuit because the critical isthmus is where you really want to go and ablate. And then you can have a lot of bystanders that have really nothing to do with the tachycardia at all. And the bystanders could be completely remote somewhere here or they could be bystanders that are connected to the circuit itself, which is often a little harder to figure out and that's where entrainment becomes helpful. So you could have bystanders connected to the loop, uh, the inner loop here. You could have bystanders connected to the common pathway or the, or the critical isthmus of the circuit. And these can often be hard to distinguish from an actual critical isthmus, and that's where entrainment is helpful. Does that make sense so far? So when we talked about what all to look for, we first said we look at what the timing of the electrogram is going to look like, right? So in a VT that is re-entrant, there is going to be activation of the myocardium throughout the cycle length at some part of the myocardium, right? So during the diastolic period between the two VT beats, most of the activation is happening in this critical isthmus because this is the slowest part of the circuit. So if you are in the critical isthmus, there is going to be typically a mid-diastolic signal. So you want to see a diastolic signal when you identify a critical isthmus. Similarly, if you're going to have an exit site, the local electrogram at an exit site is going to occur just before the onset of your next QRS. So it's going to be a pre-systolic signal or a late diastolic signal. So exit sites often are pre-systolic or late diastolic. And if you're going to have an entrance site, it's going to be a very early diastolic signal. So it's going to happen right after the end of the previous QRS. Now, does that make sense? Now, as far as the loops are concerned, outer loop and inner loop typically would have a systolic signal because those parts of the circuit are getting activated when the QRS is actually happening, okay? And the bystanders could basically have any kind of uh, um, timing with, in regards to activation, but bystanders that are connected to the circuit itself often have diastolic signals. So just seeing diastolic signal doesn't mean that you've identified a critical isthmus. You really have to do the maneuvers to make sure that it's not a bystander. So we'll start with the easiest one. What happens if you're pacing from a site that's a remote bystander? Uh, video is not working. Oh, there it is. Okay. So what happens if you start from a site that's a remote bystander here? So it's totally not connected to any part of the circuit. So here it's going to go all the way from here, get activated, and then activate the, uh, uh, the uh, go into the entrance site and then activate your circuit and then come out. So you're going to have manifest fusion on your surface ECG. It won't be concealed. It's going to look like somewhere in between the tachycardia and your uh, paste beat, okay? 
and then it's going to take time for this to go through the circuit and then come back to the electrode. So PPI or the post-pacing interval is going to be much longer than the tachycardia cycle length. So there's going to be manifest fusion on the surface ECG and PPI is going to be longer than the uh, tachycardia cycle length. And you know you're nowhere near the circuit at some remote bystander. So another example of that, this is the tachycardia, this is the paced morphology, this is the last pacing spike here. You see that this looks nothing like your tachycardia. Before doing all this, we have already proved that there is entrainment and reentry. okay? So we are kind of going to the next stage of this. And you can see that the local electrogram here on the pacing spike, PPI is 862, tachycardia cycle length is just 780, so the PPI is much longer than the TCL, and this is some remote bystander. What if you are in the outer loop of the circuit, right? So let's see if this one will play. Okay, so if you are in an outer loop of the circuit, your pace beat is going to go through the entrance side, through the common pathway, come out, but there's still going to be manifest fusion outside of the circuit because although you're, although you're kind of part, you're within the uh, re-entry itself, you're not within the common pathway for the circuit. So there's still going to be manifest fusion, but the time it takes for it to go through and come back is going to be similar to the tachycardia cycle length. So PPI is still going to be similar to the TCL or the tachycardia cycle length but you're going to have manifest fusion on the surface ECG. Does that make sense so far? I don't know, uh, I hope. But please do stop me if you feel like I'm going too fast or some of this doesn't make any sense. So another example of that, so this is tachycardia here and this is the paste beat. It looks very different from the tachycardia and there is manifest fusion. But if you look at the local electrogram and the pacing uh, catheter, the PPI is very similar to the, uh, the cycle length of the tachycardia itself. And PPI equal to TCL, but manifest fusion, you, you have to think about some outer loop. Do you, want to pay, do you want to ablate here? Typically, no. It won't do anything to the tachycardia circuit if you ablate here. How about an inner loop of the tachycardia? So one of the clues that you're going to be in an inner loop is, is the fact that the local electrogram itself is typically systolic. It happens during activation of the QRS. And let's see, there we go. So if you're going to pace from the inner loop, the PPI is going to be equal to the TCL, right? Because it, the time it takes for the activation to go through the circuit, come back to the, uh, to the pacing catheter is going to be the same as the tachycardia cycle length. So the PPI is going to be similar to the tachycardia cycle length, and there is going to be, there is going to be typically manifest fusion in these cases, but what you would find is there's not going to be a diastolic signal during this uh, tachycardia. So another example of that here, so you're pacing from here, and the paced beat actually looks exactly the same as the tachycardia beat, and this pace beat is actually going to this last entrained beat here. And the local electrogram that gets captured is this fractionated electrogram, it's not this sharp electrogram. You can see the sharp electrogram gets released when you're pacing. So the PPI is going to be very similar to the TCL. There's going to be manifest, I'm sorry, there's going to be concealed fusion, but the actual electrogram itself occurs during systole, and that typically tells you are in the inner loop. This is not a site where you would have success ablating. How about the central isthmus? That's, that's the part where we want to go and ablate, right? So if you're within the isthmus of the circuit, you're going to have a PPI that looks exactly similar to the tachycardia cycle length, right? Because it's going to take the exactly the same amount of time that it takes during pacing as during tachycardia. So PPI will be equal to TCL. It takes the same path as the tachycardia itself when you pace. So the paced morphology is also, or the fused morphology is going to look exactly like the tachycardia morphology. So there's going to be concealed fusion. There's going to be PPI equal to TCL. 
and your local signal is going to be a nice mid-diastolic signal or at least somewhere in diastole is what, where, what you want to see. You don't want to see a systolic signal for this. And once you see this, you know you're going to have success. You want a blade there and anchor it to whatever anatomical points you have next to it. So another example of that, this is the tachycardia again. This is the pace beat. You can see there is a long stim to QRS delay. Another pace beat, long stim to QRS delay. And the local electrogram that's getting captured is this one. And your PPI is exactly equal to the tachycardia cycle length. So PPI equal to TCL, your local electrogram is right smack in the middle of diastole, right? So now you know it's a critical isthmus, but you want to go one step further and make sure that this is not some bystander, because you can have bystanders with local diastolic signals as well. So what do you do for that? You want to look at what the stim to QRS is and what the electrogram to QRS is. So say if, I'm, if my catheter is in one of these bystanders here, and I pace from here, there's, there's going to be some time taken for the paste um, wave front to go from the bystander into the circuit, through the circuit, and then come back to the bystander. So the stim to QRS, or the PPI itself, is going to be longer than the tachycardia cycle length. And during tachycardia, this bystander is going to get activated simultaneously as the rest of the circuit. So the electrogram to the exit of the QRS is actually a pseudo interval. It's not a real interval during tachycardia. So the electrogram to QRS is going to look short during tachycardia if you're in a bystander. I'll repeat that once more. So if you're in a bystander and you're pacing from there, and you're going to compare what happens for the interval from the stimulus to the QRS during pacing, and what happens to the interval from the electrogram to the QRS when you're not pacing during tachycardia, okay? So during pacing, your pace stimulus is going to take some time to get into the circuit, go around, and then come back to the bystander electrogram, right? And so there is going to be additional time taken during pacing. So your stim to QRS is going to be longer. But during tachycardia, this is all getting activated simultaneously. This is going around in the circuit and activating the bystander and at the same time coming out to produce the QRS. So that electrogram to QRS is a pseudo interval. It's not a real conduction time. So that interval is going to look much smaller. It's going to look EGM to QRS or the electrogram to QRS is going to be shorter compared to the pacing to the pacing stim to the QRS interval. So that's one of the things that you can use to distinguish whether you're in a critical isthmus or if you're sitting in one of these bystander pathways. Another, another parameter that you would use is the PPI and the TCL, right? So if the, the post-pacing interval from a bystander circuit is going to be much longer than the tachycardia cycle length. Again, the same concept. It take, takes time to get out of the bystander pathway and then come back to it. So let's look at an example of that. Just to but once we get this kind of I have a few tables too and I'm happy to share slides with the audience once you get this down and you do it in a few cases it becomes much easier you just have to have a mental picture of what a bystander would look like and then look at what the PPI and the TCL would look like. So here we are pacing again. The paste morphology looks exactly like the tachycardia morphology, right? So it's not manifest, it is concealed fusion. So you know you're somewhere near the circuit, but you want to make sure it's not, you're not in a bystander. So here the captured uh, electrogram is not this huge electrogram that you see on the uh, electrode here because you can see that it's actually getting released during pacing. So one of the things you have to be careful about, the captured electrogram is actually the small fractionated electrogram here, which is kind of early diastolic signal, okay? So if you measure the PPI to that signal, it's much longer than what the uh, tachycardia cycle length is. So although it looks like concealed fusion, 
the PPI is much longer. So now you know you're really not in the critical isthmus. Something needs to be uh, sorted out. One of the things to be wary of is sometimes you can have extreme delay within uh, the critical isthmus too. So there's a lot of decrement. You can see that the PPI is longer than the TCL, but it's typically not this long. You may see like a 30 millisecond decrement or a 40 millisecond decrement. You're not going to see a 100 millisecond decrement. So once you know that something is going on here, you can measure the uh, stem to the QRS. So to do that, you want to really know what the last accelerated QRS is. So if you think this is the last accelerated QRS, the stem to QRS is extremely short, right? But you have to be very careful in these situations. This really is the last accelerated QRS because this comes in the, at the pacing cycle length. So this stem to QRS should be compared to this electrogram to QRS, and you can actually even see with your naked eye without a measurement here that this stem to the QRS is much longer than if you go from this electrogram to this QRS. So now you know that you're actually sitting in a bystander. You don't really don't want to ablate you. How about the exit site? Okay. So if your electrode is actually at the exit site, you're going to look like mostly a concealed fusion, but if you're a little further away from it, there could be multiple exits out of a circuit and you may actually look like manifest, but your PPI often is equal to the TCL, unless you're pacing at very high pacing output and capturing everything around it, in which case your PPI may actually be shorter than the TCL. But most of these situations, it would be very similar. You'll have concealed fusion, but your stem to the QRS is going to be very short. You see how short the stem to QRS is? And it's going to be similar to the electrogram to the QRS here, and the PPI will be similar to the TCL. So that's your exit site. Again, exit site is typically not a target for ablation. You want to know where that mid-diastolic signal is before you ablate. And if it's an entrance site, I think we, I don't have an example of that right now, but if it's an entrance site, it's going to look similar to the concept that we discussed for the critical isthmus itself, but the stem to QRS is very long. So a stem to QRS that's about 70% or more uh, of the tachycardia cycle length, you want to be thinking about the entrance site into the circuit. And you could ablate there. Eventually, you could go and ablate there, but you want to really identify the critical isthmus. Come on your first ablation of the critical isthmus before you ablate at the entrance sites. A couple of more concepts here uh, when we think about entrainment. One is making sure that you actually capture. You can see here that the tachycardia is going on and you know, you're pacing and you come off. There, is, there, there would be an electrogram. There is a lot of enthusiasm to go measure the PPI. But if you look at it closely, the, cap, the, the pacing is actually not capturing. So the, pace be, the pacing spikes are marching through and the tachycardia is going at its own cycle length. So you don't, this is not entrainment, you didn't capture, there is no overdrive pacing here, so you want to repeat this thing. Another thing that you see very rarely, but probably more so in exams, if you go and sit for like the IHBRE and those exams is non-global capture and subthreshold capture. So if you're actually within a critical isthmus of a circuit and you deliver a subthreshold stimulus to just depolarize just that part of the circuit, you're going to terminate tachycardia, right? Or if you have local capture but not global capture, so you have capture of the local electrogram still, but it doesn't exit out into the rest of the myocardium and cause a QRS, that's non-global non capture. So both subthreshold capture and non-global uh, non capture with termination of tachycardia would indicate that you're actually sitting at the critical isthmus of the circuit. You see it more often probably in, uh, in exams, as I said. Uh, rarely you see it in practice, but it's something to really pick up on because you know you can come on and get rid of the tachycardia. And if you see that, you want to see it maybe a couple of times to be sure that this is not some fluke that you're getting uh, um, you know, fooled by. So here you have pacing going on during tachycardia, pace beat, pace beat, pace beat, pace beat, and then tachycardia suddenly terminates. And you know this is subthreshold capture because 
you can see during actual capture there are some electrograms that come through after the capture which don't happen in, when, when subthreshold capture ha happens. So this is not non-global capture, this is actually subthreshold stimulation. Same patient happened at least three or four times. So you, 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 you know this is really part of the circuit and you could come on. So same patient, again pacing, you have subthreshold stimulation, termination of tachycardia, and then the beat after that captures with a different morphology. So that's actually the paced morphology, okay? So that's subthreshold stimulation with termination of tachycardia. I think, um, are we up for time, or should we no, look no, at a few? No, 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 you can go ahead. Okay. If we are going to, are we going to look can at a few live cases, one? or? Oh, ta yeah. So the table, I'm not going to bore everyone with the table, but I can put that up as, uh, as a resource for you. You can have the slides and take a look at it later.